work in Kung Fu includes stances, kicks and steps. Stances mean the way a practitioner stands. There are different stances in different Kung Fu styles. For example, the meridian stance. The twisting stance. The back turning stance. The front stance. The high half hanging stance. The quadrilateral stance. Kicks mean the movements of the lower limbs to attack or defend. Whereas steps mean the way a practitioner moves his legs to advance, retreat, or go sideways. The stances in the Wing Chun system is called the Character 2 Adduction Stance, which includes three poses, namely the frontal stance. The whole structure of the body and legs of this stance look very similar to that of the Eiffel Tower. The sidling stance. It's formed by turning aside from the frontal stance. Therefore, it's also called the turning stance or the diagonal stance. The advancing stance. This stance converted from a frontal stance or a sidling stance by advancing one leg forward. The frontal stance is posed in such a way that the two feet are turned inwards to form an imaginary equilateral triangle. In this pose, the head, the trunk, and the knees are on the same straight line if seen from the side, and the back of the head forms a right angle with the soles of the feet. The most important point in training the Wing Chun stance is to form a kind of linked force between the knees. We call it the linkage effect, as if the knees are linked by a spring, which can prevent loss of balance and allows any of the legs to resume original position when being attacked. Non-adduction of the knees, thus failing to create the linking effect, causes over-relaxation of the lower limbs and renders them liable to collapse when being attacked. <laughs> Some Wing Chun practitioners lower their trunks and legs too much. This not only causes them to feel very tired easily, but also causes big difficulty in moving their steps. Due to the abducting force of the Wing Chun stance, the resulting stability of the lower body gives the practitioner the advantage of moving smoothly and much quicker than the people who use a lower stance. The difference between a turning stance and a sidling stance is that the turning stance is a movement and the sidling stance is a pose. When turned, the two feet are placed on the diagonal line of two squares and all the body weight is shifted to the rear leg. The aim of the turning stance is to change the frontal stance to the sidling stance to nullify the opponent's frontal attack. However, it's not the Wing Chun practitioner who turns himself. He only makes use of his opponent's driving force to cause him to turn. Just like the turnstile at the entrance of a bank, it has no power itself. It's you who turn it. It turns in the direction you push it. And the power comes from you. Therefore, the term passivity becomes the important key in the defense concept of the Wing Chun system. A correct Wing Chun turning stance can completely nullify a heavy punching force because you actually haven't blocked or deflected his punch. You've only contacted his arm and let his coming force push you aside so your upper body is totally out of his attacking area. <laughs> Many Wing Chun people shift 30 to 50% of their body weight onto their front leg so they're unable to clear their whole upper body from the opponent's attacking area. There are many variations in the Wing Chun steps. The most commonly used steps are the advancing steps.
The sideway advancing steps. The side steps. The alternative steps and retreating steps. While moving, the front leg of the Wing Chun practitioner doesn't carry any body weight. It only acts as a subsidiary support to prevent falling forward because the whole body weight rests all the time on the rear leg and the center of gravity does not swing to the front at any moment. If you shift part of your body weight onto the front leg, you can't keep your center of gravity stable when you're pulled by your enemy no. and you fall forward easily. When you walk, your body weight is first shifted to the left leg as your right leg steps forward. Then your body weight is shifted to the right when your left leg steps forward. This makes your center of gravity swing left to right all the time like the pendulum of a clock. Most Kung Fu styles use the traditional walking and running steps combined with hops and jumps in which the center of gravity alternates in a big degree. The Wing Chun steps are designed with a unique gliding motion in which one step brings both legs forward. This enables the body weight to rest all the time on the rear leg and shortens the duration of a step because we only use one step to bring two legs forward while our enemy has to use two steps to move two legs. Chapter 1, The Frontal Stance. Relax your whole body totally and set up the basic old character two reduction stance. The distance between the two feet should be calculated as the one and a half step of the setting stance. Your upper body should be perpendicular to the ground when you bend your knees and turn your toes outwards. Then your head, trunk and knees form a straight line after you set up the stance. Your knees should be adducted to each other. The upper body is relaxed, respiration should be smooth, energy is exerted at the knees only. Wrong movements. Your upper body is out of the perpendicular line to the ground when you set up your stance. Don't push your bottom backwards. <laughs> or bend your upper body too much backwards. Chapter 2, the Gonsao and Straight Line Thrusting Punch. Begin by taking the frontal stance, then cross your arms in front of your chest with the left arm on the right arm. Chop your arms down along the vertical midline. Rotate both your arms and return to your chest. Now hold the left fist at the center of the chest. Punch, circle your hand, withdraw again. The down chopping movement of the crossed Gonsao should be done with flexible force from the center of the chest downwards along a slant straight line. The arms are not absolutely straight, but are not bent at the end point. The straight line punch should be executed at shoulder level height. Too high will leave a big space for your enemy to attack you from below, too low will give your enemy a chance to attack you from the upper position. Bend your gonsal too much and you won't be able to block the way of your enemy's attacking arm. <laughs> a gonsal too close to the body would make it too late to defend yourself. If you punch like this, you're out of the center line and give your enemy a very big chance to attack you because you leave him a big room to attack. Chapter 3. Repeat the former exercise and pay attention to the relation between the wrist and the vertical midline. Then do it with a single arm by chopping down along the vertical midline. <laughs> Never swing your arm like this, man. This is certainly not the Gonsal movement. <laughs> Too straight this time. 
In doing the exercise for pairs, the trainee who applies the gonsao should hit the wrist of his partner with the side bone of the wrist, not with the side of the palm. Chapter 4. Now combine the straight line punch and gonsao at the same time. Repeat this exercise until you're able to master the movements competently. Then switch the left and right side. Both the gonsao and straight line punch must be done simultaneously, not one after the other. Now ask your partner to launch a straight punch at your abdomen's position. When he hits, apply your new technique to counterattack him. Remember, gonsao is not a blocking movement, but a technique aimed at dissolving the opponent's attack by hurting his attacking arm. So do it slowly from the very beginning until you can master the chopping force of gonsao competently. Chapter 5, The Turning Stance. First, take the frontal stance, then with the sole of one foot as pivot, Turn your trunk to the other side and shift all your body weight to that leg. Turn back to the frontal stance. Now turn to the other side. Turn back to the center. Now turn to the other side and so on. Remember three points. Number one, when you turn to one side, all your body weight is shifted to the rear leg. However, the sole of the front leg should be placed on the ground to keep your balance. Number two, both your feet will be at a 45 degree angle when you take the sidling stance. Number three, when you turn, turn one foot first, then the turning force is transferred to another foot while the trunk is turned back to the center. If you fail to keep these three points, your turning stance will be very ineffective. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter six, the chain punches. Set up your Wing Chun frontal stance and take the pre-fighting posture. Now throw the left straight line punch first, then the right punch, and so on. When you do this exercise, you should use the whole arm all the time and make it totally stretched. The punch should be thrown straight forward along the center line and over the other arm so that the opponent can't get a chance of getting in. Chapter 7, Advancing Steps and Retreating Steps. Set up the frontal stance first. Now move one leg forward along an arc to step on position one. When your front leg steps down, make use of the linkage force of your front leg to pull your rear leg and your whole body to slide forward on the second box as in the diagram. Remember, during the whole process of the advancing steps, the body weight is always rested on the rear leg and the center of gravity has never moved forward or backwards. The rear leg, which bears the whole body weight, has no moving power itself, whereas the front leg, which bears no body weight, responds to move forward and pull the rear leg and the whole body forward at the same time it steps down onto the floor. Chapter 8. Now combine the chain punches with the advancing steps. Coordination is the key word. Therefore, you should practice the former two exercises adequately until you can competently master both the hand and foot technique before you do this exercise. Chapter 9, Tan Sao and Wu Sao. The Tan Sao and Wu Sao are two important movements for defensive purposes. When doing this exercise, take the frontal stance first and stretch the arms to the front along the center line slowly. The forearm of the Tan Sao should be at a right angle with the trunk, and the elbow is at a distance of a width of a fist from the body. When circling the palm to form the Wu Sao, the elbow should turn out to form a triangle with the center line and the chest.
Chapter 10. First, take the pre-fighting posture and frontal stance. Now turn your body to the right side and apply the Tan Sao with your left hand and a straight line punch with your right hand. Turn back to the center and take the pre-fighting posture again. Then repeat the same movement. This is the high Tan Sao and the forearm should be level with the shoulder and the punch all the time occupying the center line. Now ask your partner to step forward and attack you with a straight line punch. Apply this movement to defend and counterattack him at the same time. Chapter 11, Practical Attack and Counter-Attack Exercise. If he places his two arms at a height between his chest and abdomen, hit him at his chest with your forearm, pressing the bend of his forearm. If you hit his face, use your second hand to block his front arm. If he opens his arms wide, just move in and attack his face. He can't hurt you at the same time you're attacking him. You can also use the sidling Tan Sao and punch movement to fight against the jab. Chapter 12. This is the Fuk Sao and Punch exercise. First, take the pre-fighting posture, then follow the same action as shown by Sifu Leng Kun. Remember, never get away from the center line or you'll give your enemy a good chance to hit you. Chapter 13. Now combine the steps with a Fuk Sao and punch exercise. Remember to punch and step at the same time. Ask your partner to take the pre-fighting posture. Step forward and press down his front arm with your Fuk Sao and punch him with a thrusting punch. Never break it into two movements, or you'll get hit before you can hit your enemy. Oh, no. <laughs> Chapter 14. This is the Pak Sao and Punch exercise. First, follow the movements as shown by Sifu Leng Kun. After you've mastered the movements smoothly, combine the steps with the Pak Sao and Punch technique. Ask your partner to take the pre-fighting posture. 
The first movement in this exercise is called the indoor area Paxal technique, while the next one is the outdoor area Paxal technique. Chapter 15, Tansao and Punch with Sidestep. First, practice the sidestep individually. Then combine the Tansao and Punch with sidesteps. Now ask your partner to attack your head with a roundhouse punch. Do it slowly in the beginning until you can dissolve a real attack. Chapter 16. Counter the downward overhead punch. First practice this Mansao movement individually. Then combine it with steps. Now ask your partner to attack you with an overhead swinging punch. Remember the slant angle of the mansao is the main point. Do it in a slow manner with your partner to find out the best angle to deflect his punch effectively. Chapter 17, the high and low Gon Sao. The following exercises are techniques specially dealing with kicks. The high and low Gon Sao, also called the scissors Gon Sao, is one of the most effective techniques to deal with roundhouse kicks and sweeping kicks. After you block the kick, you should counterattack immediately. The angle formed by both of the arms must be like a pair of wide open scissors. If your arms are placed in such a posture, your chance in defending your enemy's attacking kick is very little. Oh, no! <laughs> Chapter 18, Guatsao and Lao Sao. The Guatsao is a downward wiping movement, followed by the Lao Sao, the scooping movement, with a throat cutting hand applied by the other hand at the same time, coordinated with the advancing step. Therefore, you should do it in a very slow manner Aye. until you can really master the whole process. <laughs> then ask your partner to attack you with a side kick or a roundhouse Aye. kick. As this is a very dangerous counterattack, your partner should wear protective guard to avoid being fatally wounded. Chapter 19, a kick to counter a kick. Practice this movement several times. Then do it with your partner. The stamping kick on the back of your partner's foot is fatal. Don't hurt him by carelessness. Chapter 20, Frontal Kick and Stepping Punches. The characteristic of the Wing Chun kicks is that we don't withdraw the leg after we've kicked. Instead, we step onto the same position where we kicked at. Pay attention to the slow motion and see how Sifu Cheng Chun Fun moves. Chapter 21. This is another effective technique to counter a roundhouse punch. Step one pace to the left back and launch a side kick to the front while dashing out the right hand to distract the opponent's attention and ensure the enemy's punch does not touch your head. When you can master this movement smoothly, do it on the other side. Chapter 22, The Lifting Punch. The Lifting Punch is incorporated in the Chum Q form, the second form of the Wing Chun system. It's applied when the enemy is standing in such a position that the Wing Chun practitioner finds it difficult to use the straight line punch. Chapter 
Chapter 23. You can also apply the lifting punch to fight against your enemy when he tries to rush you or hug you with his arm. In fact, you can apply this punch flexibly under similar conditions. Chapter 24, The Hooking Punch. The hooking punch is incorporated in the Butze form, the third form of the Wing Chun system. Generally speaking, the best time to execute the hooking punch is when you're standing at a right angle to your opponent or when your opponent sets up a strong guard with his two arms in front of himself. Chapter 25, the neck pulling hand and the hooking punch. The neck pulling hand is a technique incorporated in the wooden dummy technique. It can be used in collaboration with other offensive techniques to render heavy attacks at the opponent. Any attacking technique applied in connection with this movement is magnified several times in its destructive power and thus becomes a kill. Chapter 26, the vertical downward elbow. If you apply a right straight line punch at your opponent's face and he dodges quickly to your lower side to evade your punch, having missed the punch, don't withdraw your right arm, but instead convert it to a palm to press down his neck and apply a heavy left downward elbow strike at the center of his back. Chapter 27, The Elbow Hacking Technique. The technique introduced in this and the next chapter is a technique from the Chung Q form. It can be subdivided into the regular elbow hacking technique and the reverse elbow hacking technique. The regular elbow hacking technique is more commonly used than the reverse elbow hacking technique. It can be applied to attack the breastbone, the collarbone, the head, and the throat of the opponent. As it is a very dangerous movement, you must be very careful in applying it during practice, and your partner should therefore wear protective guards. Chapter 28. Watch the following demonstrations carefully and practice them one by one with your partner. Ah! 
Chapter 29, the downward elbow strike. To counter a throwing technique, you can apply either an elbow hacking or a downward elbow strike. Ask your partner to throw you. When he turns, give him an elbow. You can also apply the downward elbow strike to counter the neck pulling hand. Chapter 30, coordination of the downward elbow strike and knee thrusting technique. There's a fatal knee technique in Thai boxing. First, the attacker attacks you with a roundhouse kick. However, when you block his kick, he hugs your neck with hands and executes a knee strike at the other side of your ribs. To counter this, you must raise your knee to attack him first before he raises his knee. Then apply the downward elbow strike diagonally at his face. Chapter 31. If your opponent bends down to hug your lower part, an upward knee strike also works. <laughs> Chapter 32. If you launch a kick and your enemy reacts quickly by holding your foot and controls your arm as well, what will you do then? At this moment, you should all at once bend your knee to launch the forward knee strike at your enemy. This is a remedial technique for turning the loser to a winner. Chapter 33. The circling step is a technique incorporated in the Buzi form. Practice the circling movement as demonstrated by Sifu Zhengchun Fan until you can smoothly master it. This chapter explains one of the applications of this technique. Combining the neck pulling hand with this technique can effectively put your enemy on the floor when he steps forward to attack you. Many Chinese martial artists usually like to imagine a series of continuous actions to make them look very complicated and call them the advanced technique. Take this one, for example. However, it may be all right for demonstration because his partner keeps his left arm all the time at his own side. In fact, it can be like this. Therefore, the more complicated your movement is, the more chance you offer your enemy to defeat you in practical application. If you think that your enemy is a dummy, you're a dummy. Many Wing Chun instructors teach their students to take a typical Wing Chun pre-fighting posture and wait for their enemy to move in. However, it is totally wrong for practical fighting because once you stand steadily, all your weak points will be exposed to your enemy.
Therefore, a good Wing Chun fighter should not keep standing still. Under any normal practical fighting conditions, it's just not intelligent to wait until your enemy starts to move. When facing an enemy who is good in using kicks, many Wing Chun men are afraid of being kicked and therefore will keep a distance from their opponent. However, this is totally wrong because all good kickers know that it's more convenient for them to apply a leg technique if their enemy keeps a long enough distance from them. The reason is very simple. Let me put it to you this way. Suppose you face a man who carries a gun. The only chance for you to avoid being shot is that you stop him at the first moment before he draws out his gun. Once he draws out his gun, you have no more chance. The same principle applies when you fight against a good kicker. If you keep close enough to him, you'll eliminate his chance of kicking. Many Chinese martial artists stick too much to the formality of the movements. However, when you're in a real fight, you will never get a chance to think over which movement you should or should not use, as your enemy will never follow the exact sequence of the movements you've learnt. Therefore, a good Wing Chun fighter will never stick to the sequence of movements, but put all he's learned together flexibly into a practical application under various circumstances. For example, the Wing Chun hand technique is usually applied with a standing posture. However, it can also be applied for ground fighting purpose. Strength training in the Leung Tin's Wing Chun system is regarded as the most important exercise. The wall bag is specially made for training the punching force. We can apply the chain punches on the wall bag. The key is that you should stand about 18 inches or 45 centimeters away from the wall bag. While punching, force should be exerted from the elbow. Never use brute force in punching. In the beginning, about 50 punches will be the maximum. If you feel the shin of your fists turn sore, stop it.
kicks on the wall bag is the more advanced training. We can apply three kicks on the wall bag. Say, the frontal kick, the side thrusting kick, and the slant thrusting. Do it continuously with the same leg until you feel tired. In this training, you don't just train your kicking power, but also strengthen your stance. The suspended sandbag is ideal for the training of elbows and knees. When doing the elbow strike, don't use your body weight to lean on the sandbag. Keep your center of gravity stable all the time. Protective equipment is necessary for the Wing Chun practitioner who wants to practice real fighting with their partners. The most important equipment includes the gloves, the headgear, the bodyguard, and the groin supporter. The equipment as shown here is specially designed and produced by the Leung Ting Sportswear Factory and Company for the safety of Wing Chun trainees. Being a fighter, especially for fighting competitions, is quite different from being a practitioner for ordinary defending purposes. A kung fu fighter in the ring, especially a professional one, needs not just fighting techniques, but stamina. This must support him for a long-lasting energy against his opponent for several rounds he is going to fight. Therefore, chain punches with non-stop steps will be the first Go. exercise for him. In the beginning, he only needs to do this exercise for one minute. Then take a break for one minute. Do this for at least three times, then take a longer break. Then start again. Please note that he should not slow down or give up in between. A week later, the duration will be elongated to two minutes each round, taking one minute break in between then go on longer and longer time, more and more rounds. A few weeks, add in the thrusting kick in between the chain punches and non-stop steps during the workout. He should try his best to kick and punch until he's used up all his energy in each round. Please note that the reason we don't wear a leather glove target is that we need to minimize the target as well as to feel how powerful the puncher can punch. Please note that the trainer should move speedily and indefinitely. In this case, we can train how accurately and how heavily the puncher can punch. In fact, doing the non-stop chain punches with heavy kicks in between during the stamina exercise is also a very good training exercise for the Kung Fu fighters. In this exercise, the trainee can develop his long-lasting stamina as well as strong punching and kicking power. A 
kung fu fighter in competitions needs to wear heavy and thick gloves to fight for many rounds. This exercise is to make the fighter get used to punching with weights. Pay attention to in slow motion. This exercise is also very good for the developing of the extensors. This exercise is also very good for developing the extensors. Other than stamina training exercises, we emphasize very much on the heavy punch power. Therefore, the fighter should do chain punches hundreds of times every day. Other than non-stop chain punches, he can also punch to launch the thrusting punches with advancing steps. Please pay attention that a Wing Chun fighter would never actually stand still while punching. However, the most important exercise to develop the extremely heavy power should be the punching on a wall bay. In this training, the puncher is not punching the sandbag, he is punching the wall behind the sandbag. Fighting competitions are normally classified by weight. Therefore, the lighter weight class you attend, the easier for you to become a winner. Other than having a Turkish bath, here is a very effective training exercise that, could, that can reduce your weight within a very short period. Do put on at least two to three thick underwears plus some thick jackets. Do the violent chain punching and thrusting kicks continuously in a hothouse for hours. Here we introduce some special techniques for a fighter who wants to become a winner in the fighting contests. Pay attention that you don't fall onto the floor with your spinal bone. You should fall with one side of your shoulders. Don't look at the sky, look at your opponent so your head should not hit the floor. This time you should roll over immediately. This is the way to get away from the opponent when you're in a really bad situation. This is a fighting tactic more than a fighting technique. Pay attention that you must start the attack right after the whistling of the referee. Listen carefully. Never start before the whistling of the referee. Most of the Kung Fu fighters find it very difficult to deal with. The roundhouse kick, the truth is, after a long practice, a Wing Chun fighter can easily take care of this movement and make his opponent be mired in difficulties. Another common attacking technique applied by the fighters is this grabbing movement, especially when they are in Kung Fu fighting. However, you must clearly understand that if the back of the opponent can be attacked, you may have to change to another technique to deal with it. The knee strike is also a very good close ranging attacking technique applied by the Thai boxers or professional fighters in the ring. There are two ways to deal with an opponent who is good at knee strikes. The first method is to counter attack him with a knee strike at the time he is applying with a knee strike. You can also apply the special throwing technique at the time your opponent is trying to hug your neck for a knee strike. Now watch the slow motion once again. In fighting contests, the longer a fighting match is on, the easier you can be trapped. Therefore, here we introduce some commonly occurring situations. When you fall down, you should look at your opponent's eyes and thrust kick at him immediately. Although you may lose some points, it's better than you lose time. Of course, if you're an expert in launching this ground scissors leg technique at the time you're being thrown, you won't just turn the tables, but you'll also gain a burst of applause by the audience as well.
This is another counter-attack technique you need to practice hard. Other than that, most of the fighting techniques you've learned in this video can be applied for fighting in Kung Fu contests. Yeah!